Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. I'm your host, Michael. Well, again, is my co-host, Kent, and joining us um, live special guest, uh, the Black Bird Sugar, as we like to call him, Mr. Natty Turner. What's going on, fellas? Maintaining, maintaining. How are you? How are you doing? Hang in there, man. Hang in there. Uh, for those who don't know, the Pound for Pound Boxing Report is a blog slash show slash podcast that discusses all things boxing. Our motto is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When boxing is bad, we will talk about it. The bottom line is if you're concerned with boxing, we will talk about it. Um, if you want to find information on the Pound for Pound Boxing Report, you want to find us all over social media and whatnot, uh, all over the interwebs, there are two play main places you can go. You can go to the blog page. The link for that is p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. And repeat that, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. You can also go to the podcast page. The link for that is p4pboxingreport.podomatic.com. And repeat that, p4pboxingreport.podomatic.com. On the blog page, you can find links to all past episodes of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. Podcast, you can also find blogs written by uh, yours truly. On the podcast page, you can find all previous episodes of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report uh, podcast. On both of those pages as well, um, they will we will provide links where to find us all over the internet, all over Facebook, all over Google+, all over YouTube, Tumblr, uh, the Twitter handle, which is at P4P Box Report. Uh, we got a Pinterest board, uh, YouTube page, of course, where we're doing the show live right now, um, the RSS feed, and also we are on Stitcher. Yes, we're on Stitcher. We're finally on Stitcher Radio. Got a link to that. Uh, please check us out on Stitcher. Listen to us, download us, and write a review. So, uh, let, the, let me... Uh, know what you feel about the show and how can we can make the show better. And also, lastly, we got a link where you can donate your account. And the link for that is donateyouraccount.com slash P4P Boxing Report. Let me repeat that, donateyouraccount.com slash P4P Boxing Report. Be a friend, be a pal, be a buddy. Donate your Twitter account. And what happens is any tweet that comes from the Pound for Pound Boxing Report Twitter page, uh, your Twitter account will automatically have the ability to retweet any tweet that comes from the Pound for Pound Boxing Report Twitter page. Uh, with those matters out the way, let's get the show started tonight, fellas. Doing a recap of what went down this past weekend in boxing. Uh, headlined, of course, by Gennady Golovkin making his uh, debut at the big house, the big MSG in uh, New York, as he fought Daniel Gill. Uh, Triple G scoring a th uh, stopping Gill in three, three rounds. Um, and I'll go to you on this one, Natty, since you're our guest. Um, and looking at the fight, you know, and I didn't see I didn't see Sean Sean Newton joining us live right now, all the way from Taiwan. He won't let me forget about that from Taiwan. Uh, what's going on, Sean? Not much, man. Uh, now back to the subject, going to you, uh, Natty, and then you can follow up Sean, and then Kent, you can follow up chime in as well. And, and looking at this fight, it, it wasn't as if Gil fought a terrible fight. Um, he was disciplined. He did kind of the right things, but at the end of the day, uh, it was the power. Uh, and the strength of G uh, Triple G that just took over. Um, Gil made him miss. Uh, he landed a few shots here and there. But uh, again, the power, uh, explosiveness of Triple G, it was really the deciding factor. Yeah, um, I really, I really thought that this was going to be more of a test for Triple G. And mind you, he did test him early. I, I, will, I will give Gil the first round, even though it was a long four-minute round. I don't know if anybody else noticed that. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. What the hell? That was a long-ass round. But, um, you know, the timekeeper fell asleep. Or something. I don't know what was going on there. But, you know, I think Gil pulled out that first round, and I think he did well after the, the knockdown in the second round, you know what I mean, to, to recoup and, you know, uh, try to execute his game. <laughs> Trying to execute his game plan, but at a certain point in the fight, Triple G realized that uh, this guy can't hurt him, and every time he 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 touches the dude, you know what I mean? He's feeling he's he's, he's feeling his power. So Triple G just decided to you know bring the onslaught, take over, you know what I mean? Um, use his tech, and and he didn't force the issue. He it was very calculated, you know what I mean? He used his skills to do it, you know what I mean? He didn't just bum rush him or anything like that. He came behind his jab, you know what I mean? He threw combinations in spots where where it, it was clear to land and things of that nature. But Gil just couldn't take his punishment, man. He just couldn't take the shots. And Triple G is a very skilled fighter on top of all that. So, I mean, I expected it to be a, a, a harder fight because of Gil's experience, Gil's uh, 
being a two-time world champion. Um, I, I believe he's at least top eight in the middleweight division, you know what I mean? And Triple G not fighting a, a real true middleweight thus far, at least not, none of any true consequence, you know what I mean? This will be his first real true middleweight, but he passed the test with flying colors in my opinion, you know what I'm saying? Because I was really giving Gil props, and he took care of him just like he did every everybody else. I'll go to you on this one, Sean. Um, Curtis, me, Curtis, I, Curtis Stevens is fine. He's a nice power puncher. Uh, you know, Sean Newton is just mentioning Curtis Stevens and, and Macklin. He's a nice power puncher. But I, I wouldn't rate those two guys. You know what I mean? Especially after Curtis Stevens' last performance against an unknown, uh, that, um, the unknown, the gentleman from Bahamas. I forgot his, I forgot his name. Curryon Johnson. Curryon Johnson. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> after that fight, I mean... He, he's a he's he's a power puncher and and he ha he always has a puncher's chance because he has special power but at, on a skill level he's not in Triple G's you know category at all. Um, I'll go to you on on this one, Sean. Um, to piggyback off of, off of something that Natty said, I thought that uh, Gil would take him some rounds as well uh, because of his um, experience because of uh, he got a tricky little style because he gets gives movement. Um, Max Kellerman or the guys at HBO who's uh, noting that one of the underrated aspects is uh, Golovkin's footwork. I mean, I don't know what they what it took him so long to notice that. Uh, when you look at um, Triple G, it took him about um, a year and a half to realize the man has great footwork. Absolutely. Um, speak about what they was mentioning and what um, Natty was mentioning about the, I guess, perceived underrated skill and, and kind of professionalism of Gennady Golovkin. Um, and the fact that he's just, he's more, and he's proved this in the Stevens fight as well, if really, folks really paid attention to it, that Golovkin is more than just uh, a power puncher, more than just a, a bomber. You know, I think it's just, a, it's one of those things that, you, you know, you can't win. Power punchers get criticized for not having skill. Skill fighters get criticized for having no heart. You know, it sort of falls into that sort of plan. Anybody who's saying that GGG doesn't have skill is fucking a moron and obviously doesn't pay attention to boxing. The guy had almost 300 fucking amateur fights. Obviously, he has skill. I mean, he is a power puncher, and obviously that's what stands out most. But, I mean, you don't win 300 fights or 286 fights in the amateurs by having no skill. I mean, he knows how to fight, obviously. But people love to hate. You know, it's just like now. He finally beats a two-time champion who legitimately is a skilled fighter. I mean, I didn't think he would last six rounds because I don't think he's really a tough fighter, like a tough guy, and I don't think he could he could take it, and he showed that he couldn't because, I mean, after that last knockout or knockdown, I think some guys would have been able to continue to fight, but I just don't think he's the toughest guy. But as far as skill, I mean, he is a great fighter. He's very skilled. He's got good footwork, good hands. You know, he's always been a good boxer. Um, but now he beats a good boxer. Now I have I hear some people saying, well, he should fight a power puncher. Well, he's already fought power punchers, you know, in guys like Stevens, who lots of guys said were were, were going <laughs> to sorry we're going to knock him out. So it, he can't really win, regardless of who he fights. Oh, he hasn't fought top caliber guys. Who the fuck can he fight? Quinlan never beat a top ten guy. Sergio, he's done. Cotto. Can't fight him. He's 154. All he does is fight 154 fighters. You know, so who does that leave? Uh, Murray? <laughs> Murray ran away from a fight with him. That fight was set up, and he didn't want it. And, I mean, just like this guy, Gil, when he was champion, he didn't want the fight. He took the fight now because he lost the championship and got his ass knocked out. And, I mean, Macklin, he was a legitimate top ten fighter that had just fought Sergio and gave him a really tough fight. But then after he fights, oh, you know, he was scared. Well, Spinks. Spinks is an all-time great. <laughs> you know, one of the best light heavyweights ever. And what happened to him when he stepped in with Tyson? He got knocked out quick, and people said he's scared. Yeah, so he's scared because he fought a great fighter. And TGG sort Spinks of put was a in great light category. heavyweight, but not a great heavyweight. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. But, but the point is, he's a great fighter who was a skilled fighter, so you figure he could last more than a round just based on skill, right? Like a 50-year-old Larry Holmes could last a few rounds with Mike just based on a jab. 
So you, yeah. people expected that things would be a little more competitive than that. He, but he I just mean an analogy, you know, obviously. Yeah. But but as far as Macklin goes, I I, I think people put m too much on that <laughs> that Sergio performance. <laughs> He's looked good since then. He's looked good yeah, since then. He and then Steve, just you're the guy that you talked about, Turian Johnson. Turian Johnson just beat a big fighter just like last month or two weeks ago as well. So Turian Johnson's for real. And I mean, he gave five minutes, but he's, he's a, a tough fighter. fighter. And in his last fight, he was also. <laughs> he's a. De De Turian Johnson is definitely a good fighter. He was just not supposed to beat uh, Curtis Stephen, which I believe he did and didn't get the decision. You know what I mean? <clears throat> That's what I believe he did and didn't get the decision. He was not supposed to beat a Curtis Stevens at all. Y'all kind of didn't stole Thunder. Didn't he get stopped late? Yeah, he got stopped late. Yeah. He was winning up until that point, but, yeah, he got caught late. <laughs> I was going to ask about the future, Kodo. I will. Y'all kind of stole my thunder, but I will, I will ask uh, in a few minutes. I'll go to you on this, camp. Uh In the aftermath, um, HBO uh, signed uh, Triple G to a long-term deal. Um they're going to make a heavy investment in uh, Bernardo Golovkin. What took them so long? Yeah, but uh, yeah, you're right. What took them so long? But to the to that point, when you got when we got the numbers, the ratings in terms of uh, Bernardo Golovkin in this fight with Daniel Gill, uh, they were lower than ex than than anticipated. Uh, uh, speak on that and on Gill's attempt to kind of build the brand and build uh, Triple G uh, until uh, an American star. And a mega star in boxing. Well, I'll tell you this. Triple G got the hardcore boxing fans. He got them. They want to see him. Like like a lot of the hardcore fans that really like watching him, he's got them. There's no way that he's going to lose those people because they, they genuinely enjoy watching him. But see, what happened was the, the, the card at the, at the Garden was a little bit disappointing on a couple of fronts. Um, ticket sales weren't as expected, but I didn't expect them to fill up the garden at all. Um, that that was a that was a little bit um, part of it. Another part of it was the fact that Gil isn't really a household name, and he didn't really have a ton of, of steam behind him going into the fight. See, the thing with like Stevens. He already had that steam running. He was knocking out guys on NBC, and, and, and the fans wanted to see him in a big fight. So he had some steam there. He had some steam there. Macklin had a little bit of steam, you know, with the, with the, Mar the way he performed against Martinez. So it was acceptable. They, they, that's the two fights where he got a lot of viewers with opponents that had a little bit of steam behind them, that had some hype around them. Gil really didn't because... First of all, he got beat by Barker, and then he had a, 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 you know, you figure you try to jump back in the ring and, and, and get back to where you were before, but then that was kind of delayed, and then he ended up fighting somebody in Australia, which wasn't really, you know, it, nobody in the American market probably, you know, unless you, you downloaded the fight or watched it on YouTube, nobody got to see the hit Gilles last night, so he, there was really no steam behind, you know, the, this fight like it should have been. That being said, I, I, that that's the second thing. The third thing was I think the lead-in to this fight killed a lot of the audience. I mean, it wasn't a terrible fight, but Jennings Perez was kind of a sluggish fight. It was a really sluggish fight, and a lot of fans, you know, were probably sitting there saying, why do we have to watch this? I'm, I'm falling asleep here. These two guys aren't, you know, you know, intriguing us. It was a, it was a bunch, it was a bunch of, you know, you know, it was slow paced. The end of the fight, there was a little bit more punching, but there was also a lot of sloppiness, like hugging and grabbing, and fouling, and I think that would turn off a lot of fans, especially casual fans that wanted to see Triple G. They didn't want to sit through that type of fight. So I think there was a several elements there that caused uh, the ratings not to be as good, but I think if he's put in the ring with somebody that has some steam behind him in the next fight, the people will watch. They will watch. Trust me, they will watch him. Um, I will ask this 
it was kind of spirit was kind of taken out of the question. Uh, and I'll go to you on this one, Natty, if any of you guys can uh, follow up. Uh, the future of Golovkin. Um, look, it's, it, he seems uh, bent on unifying the middleweight division, mm -hmm. uh, even though, um, to my in my mind, um, he's the he's clearly the best fighter in the division. I don't know if he can get any all the fights with the the, the top middleweights because on one hand they don't want to fight him, they don't want to get in the ring with him on one side, and on the other side because of uh, political because of politics to quote Lennox Lewis, uh, network beef and uh, promoter war promoter beef. Um, there's always 168, uh, but they don't seem to want to fight with Ward right now. Frost released a statement, and I don't, and which HBO mentioned. I don't understand the full context of it, where Frost seemed to imply that he don't want Golovkin because he's too dangerous. Um, Hearn, his promoter, basically said the same thing in an interview that was that you can find on Boxing News 24, which he said um, he doesn't, he's not interested in a Golovkin fight right now. So, uh, when you look at the future of Triple G. Uh, where do you see him going exactly? Do you think he can pursue the middleweight, uh, this middleweight unification uh, fantasy want that he has, or is it a situation where he has to move up eventually to 168 and try to seek a fight with an Andre Ward? Well, first I want to talk about uh, the the, the so-called disappointing numbers. I think they were um, trying to really uh, feed off of that Russian. You know what I'm saying? Even though he's Kazakhstan, he's from Kazakhstan, but they were really trying to feed off that, that Russian um, community that's in New York City right now. That's why the fight was held at Madison Square Garden. That's why Rusin Pavodnikov had that fight with Algeri in, in Brooklyn like that. Excuse me, let me, excuse me for interrupting. Do you think it was a mistake on their part to have that uh, fight in the big room instead of the small yes, room? Yes, the big room. However, there was more, uh, there was so much people, they probably wouldn't have fit in the little room. You know what I mean? The, the the actual people that were at the event wasn't as bad as the the TV numbers. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now nowadays you're gonna if you're gonna be a top echelon fighter you're gonna have to do a million and above. And he did like eight hundred thousand viewers. You know what I'm saying? That's that's horrible viewership. You know what I mean? For for a, a fight on TV. I seen Tim Bradley or Tim Bradley done better than that. You know what I mean? Uh, with, with Ruslan. Uh, Canelo has done better than that. I'm 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 just talking about the free TV um, numbers, not not pay per view. You know what I mean? Well, I'll tell you this. All better than that. <sighs> Go but, the Triple G did excellent when he fought uh, Macklin. He did excellent. He did, he exceeded expectations when he when he had. What were the numbers on that? Were they were they that high? Was like one point. That was like one point three million. And you see, and and but there there was a, also a letdown because remember they were trying to make the fight with Chavez because this is a replacement fight, as well. So it's kind of a letdown, and they kind of scrambled to make this fight. But as far as his future goes, I don't think Triple G should sign in it to any long term uh, deals with HBO. You know what I mean? So I mean that might be controversial or whatever. I think he should leave his options open. You know what I mean? Because there's a guy that he could fight, like Sean is mentioning here in the comment section, in Madison Square Garden, that will get a ton of viewers, you know what I'm saying, in Kid Chocolate, you know what I mean? People are still behind that train, um, no matter how Kid Chocolate looks at, looked in his last fight. I'm, I'm really not impressed with Kid Chocolate like that, but people are still on that train. Listen, so, I wasn't impressed with there. Steven, but that fight at, at MSG, at the even in the in the in the in the little room at MSG with Stevens, that did very very well. Yeah, it it, it did okay. You know what I'm saying? But th this fight did not. And I and I and I believe with all the things I talked about, plus the short termness of you know trying to scramble for this fight. You know what I'm saying? After the Chavez fight dying out, I, I think that had to had to that played a part. But there were a decent amount of people in the room. So the TV numbers, you know, it kind of uh, balances itself out. Yeah. And if, uh, he, he, could, he could unify all these titles relatively easy. Even though he is not the so-called lineal champ, he's the best middleweight in the division so far. You know what I'm saying? So as far as I can see. Um, I don't see uh, Cotto beating him. You know what I'm saying? Too small. And I don't think he could take that power at all. Um, Sam Solomon is not not gonna beat him. Sam Solomon is awkward. Um, he'll probably uh, 
make the fight interesting for a couple of rounds because of his awkwardness. But Sam Solomon is not beating him. And Quillen, uh, Quillen only really has a puncher's chance. You know what I'm saying? His his, his skill set is just look like he's thinking too much when he's throwing punches. You know what I'm saying? It's like he's not refined as yet. He's still learning on the job, even though he has a championship belt. That's how that's how I view uh, uh, Peter Quillen. So that should that should be a, a win for Golovkin as well. So he should have a relatively easy time, you know what I'm saying, unifying these titles and becoming undisputed if these guys want to fight him. But locking himself into an HBO deal is going to make it very difficult to do so. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you about the HBO deal. The, 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 the thing with that, and I definitely agree with Sean Newton, that fighters nowadays, they want the money up front. They want to see money. They don't want to hear you talk about money. They want to see money. And if you're talk, and if you're showing them money and talking about that money, then they then they're comfortable. But if they mm -hmm. hear you talking and you ain't showing them money, they're like, why are we even talking? You don't even have the money. So you know, at the end of the day, I see why Golovkin did that because he's been fighting literally for peanuts, like not the big money, like peanuts right. just to get in the ring and and, and fight. So I see why he he signed that deal, but also it kind of takes away kind of the thing he's been doing lately because he's not getting the respect that he deserves. He was doing a little thing where he fight on HBO and then he said, well, if you're not, and if they weren't, and if HBO wasn't doing anything, he'd slide, he'd fly over, over to, to Monte Carlo. Carlo. Monte Carlo, mm -hmm. go fight on Rodney Berman's card because he had a, because K2 had a good relationship and they still have a good relationship with them. So they were, he was kind of selling his brand in both, both continents. He was selling his brand in America, and then he was selling the brand over in Europe, and that kind of takes away from that now. But I understand why he signed that deal because people, fighters, want money up front, and if they've been fighting for peanuts for so long, eventually they're going to want big money. And I, so I understand that, but I think it's 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 also it's like I said, it's a blessing for him to sign, but it's also a curse. It, it's, yeah. it's 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 whatever way you look at the deal. I mean, I, I I think he still could get a get a big money fight with Cotto and um and Sam Solomon because I, I believe he's based in Germany, right? Solomon's based in uh, Australia. Australia. No, no. Um, Triple G. Promoter is German. His promoter yeah, is from does, Germany. Does Triple G uh, live in Germany in the uh, off season. He does, ha he does have a, um he do he does have a, a place in Germany. He, yeah, his promoters are uh, the Klitschko's. So yeah, the Klitschko's, but he he does have a home in Germany. But when he comes to train, he he trains in Big Bear. He lives out Big there. With Abel Sanchez, but his his home base is in Germany. I think there could be a fight made in that part of the world with him and Sam Solomon. Sam Solomon has fought fought in Germany before. He's known over there. You know what I'm saying? That could be a big money fight on the European. Yeah, you got to be a, you still got a good to fight on the European side, and uh, the Miguel Cotto fight would be a good um, show, showing on the the American side. But that will leave Quillen out there, you know what I mean? Because Quillen is locked in with Showtime. And and the thing with 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 Sean mentioning, you know, Felix Sturm, even though Felix Sturm has passed his best day now, that would be a big sell in Germany. Definitely, but he just person. lost. He just lost. He, he would he have to get. He would have to come back with a win first. Yeah, he would have to get. He would have to get right. Get a couple, maybe two wins, and then and, and a, maybe a belt, and then maybe, maybe they if he rematch. Maybe if he rematches rematch with uh, Solomon, with Solomon, ben Solomon, fight a third time. Yep. Yeah, but I think the way Solomon beat him in the second fight, there's no reason to have a third fight. It was a one-sided beating. And given the way David he lost fight, I don't think that um, Stern can beat Solomon at this point. No, no, I think I think the thing with Sturm is now he's a little older now, and his work rate is kind of slowed, and he cannot keep up with a with a with a guy like Solomon who throws. And it would be interesting. Be, it would it be was, interesting. It would be interesting because for years, uh, Triple G tried to get a fight with Sturm when he was a WBA middleweight champ. But and that, at that point, number, but number at that point, Triple G was making nothing. Now. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that the interesting thing is that when Stern was more in his prime, he basically ducked Triple G. But now, as he's older and is on the way out, um, the fact that he will fight Triple G now, fight. You know, he, 
he even said even before the, the Solomon rematch, he said, "Yeah, I'll fight." <laughs> because he's gotten a little older and he realizes that right that you know there's there's you know when you're on, when you're on your way out, you know opportunities are few and far between. So you got to take the ones that present themselves. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if if Sturm got a couple more wins or you know you know in Germany and then all of a sudden maybe got some sort of bullshit ranking or something. Cause it cause it that's what how how boxing works. You get these these BS rankings and then and then he says oh well I want to fight Triple G. Then he'll probably get the fight, but he would have to win some fights. But even 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 now, even a faded Sturm, because even a fade, an old Sturm can sell in Germany still. And Triple G coming over there, it would make a lot of money. They would both make over, over mo a couple mil, at least, both of them. Um, let's talk about the undercard uh, bout uh, of this main event with Golovkin and Gale, and that was a uh, heavyweight, heavyweight battle title eliminator between Brian Jennings and... Uh, Mike Perez, and I'll go see you on this one, Sean, you and the, and the barking dog in the background. Um, <laughs> uh, this fight, look, for the first half of the fight, quite frankly, it was a snoozer. Um, the fight picked up a little bit over the second half because uh, Jennings, he stepped on the gas a little bit. He threw more punches. But ultimately, the fight was decided, split decision, one point win for Jennings. Uh, talk about that and talk about how a point, the point that was taken away from Mike Perez um, in the last round, how that kind of how that ultimately decided the fight, uh, the fight itself. You comment on it, and do you agree with the point deduction in the last round? You know, I mean, I think Perez has no one to blame but himself. The same as what what I said about Laura against Canelo. I mean, he showed early that he had the skill to beat Jennings. He was winning fairly easy, but then he's not in shape. He couldn't last longer than eight rounds at a at a high level, and then he he let Jennings back into the fight. As far as the point deduction, I mean, you know, it's easy to complain about something after the fact, but how come he wasn't winning the fight easily? You know, <laughs> he only should blame himself because he should fucking get his fat ass in there and train hard and do what he should do, become a top level fighter. I mean. Maybe he still hasn't gotten over the beating he gave the other guy, but I mean, the point is he showed his class over Jennings, but he let Jennings stick in the fight. Jennings did what did just enough to win, and got lucky off a point deduction. But I mean, that's boxing, right? You know, Khan loses two points for for holding. You know, you never know. You never know what judges are going to do. You never know what kind of point deductions are going to happen. That's the whole point where you have to handle your business in the ring. So these guys that that let it slip to their finger and then cry because they didn't do enough, they only have themselves to blame. Hopefully they learn from it. Next time they come, they're able to pick their game up to the level where they win decisively, you know. So I have no sympathy for him. Um, and I'm not, impressed, I'm not impressed by Jennings either. Your thoughts on the point of deduction at the, uh, in the last round that decide, ultimately decide the fight? You know... Okay. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I, I, I listen. At the end of the day, I feel you know people are too hard on Harvey Doc. I think people are way too critical. It seems like in this day and age, whenever a group of people, announcers like HBO, complain about something, everybody jumps on the bandwagon. Everybody jumps on the bandwagon, and I don't like that. I do not like that, and I don't like that mentality, and the mentality irritates me to no end, and I'm going to... Go ahead, Ken. I'm just going to say right now that HBO has an opinion, but it's not... But, but to see a whole bunch of people like crickets repeat that is so irritating because they take... Take somebody else's opinion and and they and they immediately believe that opinion. This is the way I see it, okay? If a referee tells you in the locker room um, if the referee tells you in the locker room to not foul, don't do this, don't do that, obey my commands, follow the rules, you should have no problem. 
You should have no difficulty whatsoever. Okay? I understand, yeah, he should have warned him before taking a point. Yeah, I get that. But guess what? Some refs are not like that. If they if they warn you, you know, if they warn you in the dressing room what he'll take a point for and what he's looking out for, then then you then the fighter should have no problem. I get, I, I, but I get where people are complaining. Oh, you know, like, oh, you should have warned him. I get that part, but you know what? Who's to say Harvey Doc didn't warn him in the locker room? You don't think that the referee should referee should have took maybe some discretion? Given the way the fight was going, maybe, m maybe I think he should have maybe at least once, but I don't know what what was discussed in the locker room. I don't know, you know, you know, and and frankly, it's not up the ref. Listen, the judges scored a fight, not the referee. The referees just in there to enforce the rules that go on in the ring. The ref uh, I, I was just saying that because maybe good referees, I should say. I'm not saying that Harvey Doc is it, but good for referees. Oh, he's one of the they best. Get, they they, they get a sense of the way a fight is going. They get a sense of how uh, close the action is, even if they're not judging the fight themselves. They get a sense of what's going on. And um, not saying that you're not wrong. Not to say that you're wrong, but uh, I just think that maybe he could have used some discretion in there. And at that time, at that point, I think. Even if he, when he, even if he said um, going into the fight in the dress room, um, if if A happens, then you're gonna have this kind of result. That maybe you know, let me back off a little bit here. Right. I think it was a situation where I think Harvey Doc dealt with a lot of holding during the fight because during the second half of the fight, there was a lot of rough stuff against the ropes, a lot of holding, a lot of you know, shouldering in, a lot mm -hmm. of grabbing. It was a lot of sloppy action. People don't realize how sloppy the fight broke down in the second half. Yeah, they both drew, drew more punches, but it was very, very sloppy. It was very sloppy action in the second half of the fight. And for all we know, Harvey Dot could have gotten annoyed with all the holding. You know, he could have warned him, you know, in like Sean just said, in between rounds. We don't hear everything that's being said said in the ring because most of the time the HBO announcers are gabbing over anything that's going on with their opinion and and they and they they really, listen at the end of the day I think the HBO announcers take away from the fight. It's their gab sometimes. It's their gab sometimes that you miss critical things that are going on because of their gab. Like um, their, their opinions. Their opinions. You know, I I understand you have to have an opinion, but don't gab over everything. Don't yeah, uh, analyze things. That's I, my. Opinion. I go to you on this one, Natty. When Ken was mentioning HBO, um, and, and in their role, you was kind of applauding in the background. You want to chime? You want to um, add in on that? I, I mean, I've I've always had an issue with HBO, and some and some sometimes announcers. Period, man. I, I I've even talked to Sean about this. Um, the the Colonel. And and Larry Merchant, that that team right there, oh my God, I I just I just I like, Larry. For I like Larry Merchant, so don't go too hard on him. <laughs> man, I'm done with Larry Merchant. I'm done. The Colonel is yeah, terrible. Man, I'm 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 pr I'm 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 pretty much in the minority on this panel because I had Jennings um winning relatively easily. Just because of what uh, Mike Perez was doing in the ring, you know what I'm saying? He wasn't utilizing his skills. You know what I'm saying? At he he would show it in spurts, but he couldn't. He wasn't doing it for the entire round. You know what I mean? The close, the the, the, the first couple, the first few rounds were were relatively close. You could have went either way with them. I gave him I gave him mostly to um to Brian Jennings, but for the last. Six or seven rounds, man. It was all Jennings, man, and and, and Mike Perez was pretty much giving the the, the round the rounds away. He his he, he he um was gassed at after round five. You know what I mean? And he was making and he was allowing the guy with the longer arms to win the fight on the inside. The most things the most thing he was doing on the inside was holding and pushing um um Jennings back and other, but but in in return he was getting hit with um with uppercuts and hooks. You know what I mean? Body shots. Yeah. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, when you, when, when a guy is able, the longer guy who should be using his reach and boxing from the outside, 
is using yeah. using his, that to beat you on the inside. Yeah. You, you, that is the wrong game plan. That's it. You that's know what I mean? Yeah, you're not, he wasn't using his jab. That's the thing. If he if he used his jab more, Perez, he would have kept him at bay. I yeah. mean, and he probably would have he probably would have lost that battle as well because you know he was what's his name Jennings was using his jab as well. Yeah, to keep yeah. That and, and the funny thing about that fight is the funny thing about that that entire fight that listen Perez, I, I've already come to the conclusion he's going to be remembered like Solis, a guy with very good skill that just no discipline outside the ring. He really no. should be a cruiserweight. Yeah, I've been saying that for years, Natty. I've been saying that for years that Perez should be fighting that cruiserweight, but everybody says, ah, oh, he can handle his own that cruiserweight. All right, we'll we'll see. You know, and look what happened. He got beat. And as far as the referee taking the point at the end, that's a that's a round I actually gave to Perez, but because of the point deduction, it was a nine nine round. But he was being warned throughout the fight, not a hard warn, not ah, oh, if you do that again, you know what I mean, I'll take a point. But he be, he was being warned for pu pushing his head down and doing all kinds of dirty things in the ring. He was warned before the fight in the locker room, you know what I mean, ab ab about that. And li listen to t look at the sequence of events that took place, right when he took the point. What's his he name? Mike Perez pushed him against the ropes, damn near outside of the ring, and hit him while on the him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Ram Man Victor Ortiz style. <laughs> and then tried to punch him on the break. Punch, left, left hand combination. <laughs> and um, what's his name was t was telling him to stop the action, and he continued to fight. Yeah, he he, so, he oh, literally almost clocked Jennings on the break. Exactly. So he's trying to get control of the situation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I will say. The second half of that fight, man, broke down into sloppiness. Very, very sloppy second half of the well, fight. Jennings was winning the sloppiness. <laughs> yes, he was. And I will say that. I, I will say I thought it was a close fight, but I could see why somebody would score it for Jennings because his work was a lot cleaner. It was cleaner. That's it. And 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 I, I'll, I'll be honest. I'll be honest with you. When I see Perez, I just see a guy like, like Gonzalez – and Solis, guys who had great skill, but they never, but they never had the discipline outside the ring. And another guy that reminds me of Juan Carlos Gomez, a guy that had all the skill in the world, and he has no discipline outside the ring. That's the key with these Cuban, these Cuban fighters. They have no discipline outside the and ring. They were great amateurs, and when I say they were great amateurs, they were great. They they were great, man, and they didn't fight like amateurs. That's what made that's what put them a, a, a above the rest of the guys that they were fighting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And, they fought like pros in the amateurs. Those particular guys that you're speaking of. Yeah. Go, go look up and this guy. Up, look at all the Cuban fighters in recent history that that were great amateurs and they completely bombed out as pros or didn't live up to the potential that they and you I, I can name about. Ten or twelve of them. Oh, who's who's the who's the guy that that fought um Riddick Bo? Juan the goal Juan. Man, um, Gonzalez Gonzalez. Yeah, Gonzalez. Yeah, oh my God. Jorge Gonzalez. Bus. He was a bus. No, Jorge he, Gonzalez. But, admit, yeah. but you have to admit that man had great skill as an amateur, and he could have been yes, a great. He did. One. That's he, why he, he was he supposed to Bo, be a man. He beat Bo and Lennox Lewis in the amateurs. In the amateurs. And, but he couldn't. But he couldn't translate that same d discipline and, and, and you know. The, the only fighter I I, I know it. right now who stayed disciplined and had a real good career was uh Casamayor. Yeah, that's the that's only that. one. And that's that's the only one. And and originally when I saw Casamayor as an amateurs, I didn't think he would translate into a good pro. But he learned to pro once he got to the pros. He his his style translated to the pros beautifully. Once he got there, I didn't think much of him as a as an amateur going into the pros. But once he became a pro and he showed his skill, he's probably the best Cuban out of that whole lot. This this new crop of Cuban fighters are a little better on that level. You know but, what I mean? They, uh, Rigo, Lara, um, Bartholomew, they're a little more disciplined outside the ring. Yeah, a little bit more discipline, but they what they what they, they have the discipline down pack, but that the aggression is not there. It's just not there. 
Let's move on and talk about Jennings and future. Um, like I said, this was a, a WBC eliminator uh, for Klitschko's belt. I'm sorry, he's not beating Klitschko. He's getting knocked out. Um, I don't think he fight. He will beat Stavern either if, it was, if he was the fight. Um, Deontay Wilder chimed in on Twitter I'm, that he would knock him out. I believe that he would knock him out. He would knock um, Jennings out as well. So I'm, I'm going to with Jennings. Even right though he now. won, he was kind of unimpressed. He was not really that impressive. Um, even though this was an eliminator, where does he go from here? I'm going to tell you right now what they're going to do. Vladimir Klitschko is going to give him step aside money. He's not going to fight him. Why would he fight him? There's no reason to fight it. Jennings doesn't have a foothold in boxing. He's not an economic, you know, guy who brings in millions. Number two, at the end of the day, I the only thing he Jennings has been doing is is ticket sales. That's all he's been doing, ticket sales. That's the only thing he's been doing recently. The last two fights with with uh, the Polish heavyweight and then Perez. All he is is bringing in asses from Philadelphia. That's the only thing he's been doing. And that's maybe a quarter of the seats. So what what HBO is going to do since that's, they already got that, that part handled, that they'll see, they'll see Jennings no matter what. They're going to showcase Jennings for a while on the, on the undercards of some of these, of the, some of these shows. And, he's, and they're, what they're going to do is they're going to milk this for all it's worth, like they did with Seth Mitchell. And then they're going to put, put, put Jennings in there with someone that he's expected to beat, and he loses. And that'll be the end of that. He's not that good. They're, they're going to milk this for all it's worth. He's just another guy, just another American heavyweight who's, who has the, 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 the physique. He has the, that down pat, but neither the skill, neither the toughness, the determination, or anything to get past a certain level. Um, I want to move on to uh, kind of an interesting card that took place in Manchester, um, England, um, as Billy Joe Saunders, uh, ranked middleweight, um, holds a European belt. Um, he scored a uh, eighth-round KO over a fighter by the name of Blanda, Ram Blanda Mura. Uh, also on that card, uh, Chris Eubank Jr., for those who don't know, the son of uh, former middleweight, super middleweight champion Chris Eubank. Uh, he scored a win over a guy by the name of uh, Jukic. 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 In one round. Jukic, excuse me, in one round. Um, there's been a lot of trash talk back and forth between Saunders and Eubank. Uh, both seemingly want to fight each other. Uh, and I'll go to you or anybody can chime in. Uh, talk about this potential fight between uh, Billy Joe Saunders and uh, Eubank. And also, I want to, this just come to my mind. Um, when you look at um, the 160, 168 pound division with um, Saunders, with uh, Eubank Jr., with Martin Murray, Matthew Macklin, DeGale, Frotch, um, Groves, do you see um, the rise of the middleweight, super middleweight division? Listen, I'm not, let me How, to me, it, it, it seems like it's, it, it, it's very similar to what we saw in the 90s with Ben, Eubank, uh, Collins, Michael Watson, um, James Cook, um, a bunch of uh, and some other fighters who are slipping my mind right now. Talk about the potential for Saunders Eubank Jr. Uh, fight going forward, as well as the rise, as far as I'm concerned, of the middleweights and super middleweights in England. I'm going to say right now, going into this uh, at the beginning of this year, um, Warren was pumping his three. Middleweights, his three young middleweights, Frank Buglioni, uh, Billy Joe Saunders, and Eubank. Uh, Buglioni got beat. He got knocked out, so he's cross off for now. Um, he still got Billy Joe Saunders, who's probably further along than you know, than Eubank at this point. I th Billy Joe Saunders is already fighting on the European level, and I think he's probably in line for maybe a fringe regional world title or a eliminator or a world title shot eventually. As a matter of fact, he's Saunders, let me chime in, Kent. He's ranked in the top ten by the uh, WBO, the WBC, and the IBF. Yeah, he's ranked in the top Ten by all three doesn't necessarily mean he's gonna get a big fight immediately. They're gonna probably push him towards Quillen. 
Yeah, they're gonna. That's probably where they're gonna go with him because personally, I think Billy Joe Saunders is a good fighter. I don't think he's a great fighter. I think he's. I think he gets a lot of. He gets too much hype as far as I'm concerned. There's things I've seen with him that that lead me to believe that there's something not there with him when he gets to a certain level. Um, he's definitely a good good story. I will I will say that he is a good story, but. I don't think that's his necessarily. He's gonna be. He's he's kind. He, he, I think he'll be he, at best. He would be a B level champion at best. At this, maybe even not. You know, depending on who he fights. But I think if the far as he goes, is probably B level champion. Sort of like Quillen, a guy that'll beat up on other B level fighters, but not not truly elite. Um, and you know, I look at a guy like Eubank, and he's fought. You know, everybody, he's beaten everybody he's fought, but who has he really fought? Okay, that's my thing. Who has he really fought? Nobody. I mean, he's still he's still in the developmental stages. Exactly. And even at this so point, I still he think even, he beat Billy Joe. <laughs> why would he, why would even, why would this even be entertained if you're Frank Warren, okay? You're still building a guy like... Chris Eubank Jr. and if you get him beat against Billy Joe Saunders, I think Billy Joe Saunders beats him at this point. I don't. I don't. <laughs> that I mean, I don't. He just no. I mean, Billy Joe Saunders has decent technique. He's okay. He could fight. Nice, nice. You know, slick little southpaw there with decent power. You know what I mean? But Chris Eubank is a different kind of animal, man. See, yeah, well, you see, the thing is, I don't see. What a lot of people see in Chris Eubank Jr. For some reason I just don't see it. I I, I want to see it. I I would love to see this guy become you know a, a a great fighter and become you know. But we don't know nothing about Eubank Jr. We don't know nothing about what happens when he faces adversity for the first time. We don't know how he handles certain styles. All we know is that he fights guys. He hits them and they fall down. That's all we know. That's all we know right now. And I think Billy Joe Saunders is a little bit more experienced. I think he's 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 been in with slightly better opposition. I'm not going to say it was much better, but it's slightly it, better opposition. It, it hasn't been. It's just more of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, but I would give I would give you know Billy Joe Saunders the edge because he's he was already on the European. He's already on that European level. So I I mean. At the end of the day, I think Eubank Jr. needs to start beating some guys with pulses, guys that are not from Hungary, that are like 18 and one and get stopped in the first round, or guys from Serbia or Croatia that have good records and get waxed by by guys with pulses. He needs to fight guys that are going to challenge him, that are going to show him different styles, that are going to show him things that he's never seen before. He's not getting any better by just punching a guy and falling over, and the guy's falling over. Um, your opinion on what we're talking about here, Sean, and uh, about Eubank Jr. and uh, potential Eubank Jr. Sean does fight as, as well as, as uh, far as I'm concerned, a uh, kind of resurgence of the uh, middleweight and super middleweight, the British uh, middleweights and super middleweight. I think there's a, a, a re I'm going to be honest, before you, you head it over, hit, ask somebody else, I think there's a national resurgence. I wouldn't say these guys are going to be international yet. I want to see more of them before I declare them any of that. I, I think on a national level, they're, they're creating a nice buzz. And well, I that's get, where it started in the past on a national level. Excuse me. Right. But the point is, I want to see them step up to another world level. I, I, I know they're good fighters, and I know they have amateur accolades and all that stuff, and that's great. But that doesn't. But that doesn't help. But that. But this is a whole new ball game. I want. I want to see that. That skill against that. Uh, 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 against a higher level. And the thing with Frank Warren fighters is he doesn't put them his guys in on that level, at all. He and the never, middleweight division is not. Yeah, but that, you, but it's not that deep. <laughs> no, I know it's not that deep. But can't if move these up guys, in the ring. But the, if these guys were so touted in, in the UK as they claim they are, when you try to look at look at that guy that that uh, Golden Boy has signed, Anthony Agogo, wasn't he an Olympian? Yeah. 
Look, look who he's fighting. He's fighting nobody. And this and 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 this, the guy who won the the uh, I think the silver, the bronze medal, Ryota Murata in in four fights is fought. You know, way better guys than Agogo's fought in like seven fights. He's fought nobody. You know, well, so what's their lightweight champion? He's fighting a nobody on that undercard of the Porter, Porter and um Brook fight. Um, what's the guy? Um, the WBC lightweight champion. Oh, um. Oh, gosh. Daniel Estrada. Estrada, like, yeah, Daniel. Like, no, you know, no, 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 from, from Texas. But at this point, yeah, guys, like, Daniel like, Estrada. That's who he's fighting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just say this right now that anybody whose B level is a threat to to figure out right now, he's just been exposed already. Yeah. In, so in my any, opinion as well. So I mean, it's a guy like Monty. Estrada ha does have a a, a better than you know, maybe 30 or 40 percent chance of winning. He has a lot better chance of winning based on what we saw against Belmontes. I mean, who knows what he's adjusted, but as far as I know, anybody's a threat to beat him right now on the B-level. Because Estrada, for what it's worth, he's a B-level contender. He just has a high rating with the WBC. Yeah. Um, quickly, Sean, your thoughts on what we've been talking about, what we've been discussing? You know, I, I think, that, like they say, that it's a, a good groundswell. But this isn't new. They had that already. Murray, Macklin, uh, Barker, you know, all those guys who were pushed and every single one of them had a championship fight outside their country and not one of them fought each other yet. You know, I mean, what they need to do is they need to put these guys in with each other and then let these young guys also fight one another. I mean, that was the good thing about Groves and DeGale. De Gale. They fought early you know, had themselves in, tested against quality opposition mm -hmm. to see how well they would do. I mean, for Groves, it worked out well. DeGale's been a little slow to progress, but it looks like he's going to get a title shot soon, too. And, you know, I mean, they have a lot of fighters. I mean, we don't know what quality they are because they haven't fought top-level guys. What they need to do is fight each other domestically, where they're going to make tons of cash I mean, we know fights sell in the UK, man. Gross fraud. She was giant, you know. And Ward doesn't want to go there because he's the A side. Fuck whatever. I mean, you know, people are stupid. They should go to the UK. The fight market is giant, and there is good competition from 160 to 175. And what these promoters, I mean, they have their own Cold War, which is probably one reason that's slowing this down, right? I mean, now they're sort of coming to the US because they're, they're not making the fights in the UK. But, well, but these guys need no, to fight listen, you got to realize that Frank Warren, um, he's one of the main culprits in this Cold War. Always, yeah. Always, though. Always, yeah. 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 Always. That's not new. No. No, nah, nah, listen, listen. I, I, I view, you know, Frank Warren as just a, an old guy who at one time, you know, was a, a good promoter, and he's just trying to hold on to power. But he's losing power. Other promoters are becoming bigger. You know, guys like Matchroom Sports is way bigger than him now. And yeah, they're getting ready to invade the U.S. Yeah, He's Frank Warren is just an old man. Frank Warren is just an old man that's holding on to power. No one, no one, no one in the boxing community, I mean, in the U.K., really respects him anymore. So, Don King. I'm gonna give you the. <laughs> I'm gonna give you the floor, Ken. Um, you sent me a link to a uh, pretty big upset that happened in the heavyweight division. Uh, um, it was it wasn't it's not a it, well I'll be honest with you it's not it's not a it's it it, it got no coverage obviously because it was a club show but the point is when a when a former Olympian gets beat by a guy that hadn't fought in twelve years I think that's big news. yeah I'm gonna give you the floor to talk about the fight the who fought and um uh, the meaning the significance of it the floor is yours Ken. Jason Estrada had a fight this weekend, and he's a former Olympian and, and former, you know, U.S. national champion and accomplished all these great things as, as when he was an amateur. And he turned pro, and he never realized most of the talent that he had. He, he had a discipline issue. Um, I remember one of his early fights when, when, when Showbox had him on, they put him in with Travis Walker. And he looked like a fat slob, and he ended up losing the decision. And, and 
he had an Adamek fight. He just, in his biggest fights, he always came in like a fat slob. G good hand speed, good skill, just couldn't crack an egg. And another, that was playing with another other other way. But I think a lot of that had to do with his discipline. That being said, he had a, a he was been out of the ring for the last couple of years with a with a with an ACL issue, and he came back and he fought a guy named Steve Vasaka, who was nine and zero with four knockouts. Well, little, little people would say, well, wow, he fought a guy who was undefeated. Only issue was the guy hadn't fought in twelve years. So they had this fight. It was a local fight. It was basically a fight to get Estrada back on 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 the pony and make one more run. But it didn't work out that way. Um, Estrada started out well. He won the first couple of rounds, according to what I read in an article. And then Visaka became aggressive. He started landing combinations. He started doing what he needed to do. And he eventually, by the end of the fight, he had won a decision because he took the play away from Estrada. Um, Estrada ended up being getting a, suffering a nasty cut in the fight. The eye ended up swelling shut. It was just a disaster for for Estrada, who was trying to make one more run at it, run at it, and it looks like he's probably going to fade right back to where he came from into obscurity. But I, I felt it was a very interesting result. It, it m most people didn't even you know would would pay attention to it, but it when when I went on Fight News, I saw that I felt that's something that I just would mention, you know, because it's because when a guy, a former you know Olympian. You know who who has had a lot of accolades loses a fight like that. It's kind of big news. Man, you see, fighting is more than talent. <laughs> you have no, to. In the case of Jason Estrada, yes, it is. Yeah, you, you. I mean, for for everybody, you have to be disciplined outside the ring as well, man. And Jason Estrada, to me, that's another gentleman that has never been a true heavyweight. That's a cruiserweight right there. And he's wasted maybe time. Maybe even a light heavyweight <laughs> if he could really get himself into real shape. You know what I mean? But these people are chasing money at, at, at the heavyweight division where heavyweight division is not even the money um, uh, division anymore. This ain't the 80s and the 90s. Holyfield and Tyson are gone. You know what I'm saying? The only way you make money is fighting the Klitschko and you're not even making that much fighting them. No, this not not the, listen. When you're an opponent for the Klitschko's, you'd be lucky to come away with a million dollars. That's what I'm saying. You're not even making that much fighting them. So what is the whole big fascination with I have to be a heavyweight if I'm this amount? You know, I, I have to weigh 220 pounds when I'm five foot five. It's look, cool. you know. Yeah, what I'm saying? Oh, I agree. <laughs> I agree with you 100 percent, Natty. Look at look at Chris Ariola. That man fought as a light heavyweight in the amateurs, and look how heavy he got when he became a pro. Ridiculous. Look, look at so that. Least, man. So least, uh, we just talked about it. I don't want to rehash that, but th th this is wasted talent out here, man. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Even if you're an American champion, how many American heavyweight champions has there been in the last 10 years? Not many. Not many. If Lamar not, Brewster? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but at least L Lamar Brewster, for what it's worth. I'll give that. Yeah, but for what it's worth, with Lamar Brewster, he he was a one-dimensional guy, but he tried to come in shape at least. He tried to be disciplined. And he he became a one-dimensional guy deep into his pro career because he had amateur pedigree, and he yes, didn't he fight did. like that he for, for his entire his, pro career. He fell, yeah. he fell in love Brewster with Daniel Carter. Brewster, the other guy I can remember is Chris Bird. Yeah, Chris and, Bird. But and he was a he was a middleweight as an amateur. So, yeah. Chasing that heavyweight though. <laughs> Chris Birch in, in in a perfect world should have been a light heavyweight and then a cruiserweight. He was no and, heavyweight. And he tr he tried to do it at a later age and see what happened to him, right? Yeah. He was he was done. He got knocked out like unconscious by a journeyman. He was doing the, the shake on the ground. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. You really think that, Sean? <laughs> no, but you see, he was just like taunting him on on YouTube. You can go watch the video again. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. So, uh, if, if, listen, if, if, I, I, I don't I, mean to I, jump, I jump in this. I'm not gonna mean to jump in this, but I'm gonna tell you right now. Let me let me try because folks, folks, and I've watched this video four times, and I will tell you right now, 
But yeah. let me chime in, Ken. Folks might not know what I'm, what we're talking about. Um, Shannon Briggs did it again. Uh, for those who don't know, he kind of uh, he did a who ride on uh, Klitschko's cap a few months back, and there's an Instagram uh, video that I, put, I posted on the um, Pound for Pound Boxing Report uh, Facebook page and Google Plus page. Uh, and I believe I posted on the Twitter page as well of Briggs um, storming in to Klitschko's camp again, um, raising hell, doing another who ride. Uh, I'm gonna start. Moore had to kind of break it up. Uh, Briggs seemed to be Michael once Moore. again. Briggs that was Michael Moore. Briggs up there yeah, with, with like his shirt, right with his now. shirt off. That's the last shirt, time I saw him <laughs> with his shirt off. Try to be all glistening and all sweaty and everything. Talk about what he would do to Klitschko, just like what he did. Uh, did the same thing, and I believe it was March. He did it again in Klitschko's camp. Was Klitschko just began his camp? I believe it was in Florida. So yeah, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, he, he's real thirsty for attention or thirsty for a fight. I uh, think I, I, I thought you know at first that he was just mentally gone, and I still do think that Briggs <laughs> is mentally gone. But I'm starting to think it just it just stick. It's just becoming a shtick. That's what it's becoming. It's it's Briggs is he's he's not there, but I think it's now a shtick that he's I doing to, to try to get, to try to get Vladimir's attention. And I think Vladimir is just like you know this guy. I, he's probably just saying you know what I'm just gonna go along with it. Whatever you know, it doesn't affect me whatsoever. So let's just I keep telling you he, he's thirsty for attention. Let That's me tell all you it is. He, it's a I pe- really I really think he wants to fight though. Yeah, I think he does want to fight, I but think I he think he wants to fight. He's not. He's not gonna turn it down if if this leads to the fight. He's not gonna no, be like, no, oh, he, no, he, wants, he wants to fight. He, he wants to fight, Natty. But no, if you but, saw but, the video at the but end but of it, he, point, he had his, at this point, he, he the camera and start posing and flexing. But let you know right there, it was also about the attention. WWE, oh. homie. <laughs> yeah, but let me tell you something. This is all. This is doing is this is a Shannon Briggs campaign to bring the American heavyweight scene back. This is all he, what he's trying to do, but he's not the man to do it. He doesn't have – listen, his old WWE act is not cutting it anymore. It's not cutting it anymore. No one cares. I'm looking at this guy, and I'm like, you should be in the WWE. If you sure. want to do something crazy like that, do yeah. something in the WWE. No one Put him in the ring with Brock, Brock Lesnar or John Cena. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, seriously, listen, listen. Dave Bautista did MMA. Why don't you go do MMA if you feel if you feel like you want to do something? But but this, that type of shtick doesn't work in in boxing. Vladimir is laughing at him because he doesn't really want that fight as much as Briggs wants the fight to get paid. That's the whole deal. And I think eventually at some point Vladimir is going to just say, you know what, the hype is there. Let's just make the fight. And Vladimir. Um, like what? Like we all know, he's gonna do just like the way Vitaly punked Briggs, it, 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 and every other heavyweight that had a pulse that when Briggs stepped up, he got beat. Well, well Vitaly, you know, Vitaly is a, a different animal. It will be interesting for at least four rounds because yeah, I think it would be an interesting. Because, um, Vitaly, um, Vladimir won't be able to lean on on Briggs like that, and Vitaly never had had to utilize that kind of style. No, no, but I still think eventually once Briggs starts to puff and puff, that'll be it. Yeah, and I, I have to see with my own. He went twelve rounds in his last fight, I believe. Yeah, he did. He did, but look who he fought in his last fight. That was twelve rounds. He fought a, a guy that was a punching bag that stood there for twelve rounds and got beat on. And I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, but it should still affect his stamina, no matter who he's in there with. Right. Now, I mean, he, if his asthma or whatever was gonna flare up, it would flare up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but Briggs is like, isn't it like Briggs like forty three and like a fifty four man year old man's body or something? <laughs> he's, 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 he's trying to pull. He's trying to pull a foreman, man. I. You know what? God bless him. If if this is what he wants to do, if this is his 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 dream. You know. did it eating hamburgers. Bless his heart. Bless his heart. <laughs> listen, let's 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 bless him. Two hamburgers at the press let's, conference, like let's, what? Yeah, just 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 <laughs> let's just bless him for going on this 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 crusade. But I think it's it's actually really sad to see a guy, 
you know, that desperate for attention and that desperate for money doing yeah, he what did. he's doing. Foreman did have skill, but he, he <laughs> No, but you know what Foreman he's the healthiest Foreman guy. Man. Old, but the thing was when, when Foreman got older, he did show skill. He did yeah. show some more skill. That he yeah. did have other things in the in the in the tricks. But, but when, when he, he won the championship, he was getting beat up <laughs> yep. until he landed that shot. Until yeah, he landed it. Guess, but all you need, but guess what? All in the heavyweight division, all you need is one punch. That's all yeah. you need in the heavyweight division is one shot. And and Briggs does have a, a one punch opportunity against a guy like Vladimir, but I just don't think he does it. If, I just if don't Vladimir think. is not able to tie him up like he normally does, not able to lean on him like he normally does, if he, I, I'm, I'm, I still say that you can't train a chin. No, you I can't. Believe, I believe his chin is still suspect. He's just found a way you for for you not to get to it. Yeah, and, that, and, that, and that's called being showing the weight for the force. Right, but that's but, that's what a smart fighter does. That's what he yeah. does. He figures out ways to to hide his. He, he knows where his deficiencies is, and he's like, I'm gonna have to correct something. I'm gonna keep getting knocked out by people like Corey Sanders. Right, but, but you remember, but I will say in the Corey Sanders fight. He kept getting up. He was getting nailed, but he just kept getting up. But yeah. but but he got. But everybody forgets that Corey Sanders was a massive puncher. He was a massive puncher, but at the time he was a full time golfer. True, true, true. I get. I I understand that. But the, the man could still punch, even though he wasn't in the best shape in the world. He could still punch. But then oh, eventually could, showed could you, what to do with him. Could Briggs even like get that fight? Would anyone take it serious? You know, if Klitschko fought him, people would just like. There'd be tons of videos on YouTube criticizing, you know, his level of competition and not fighting like legitimate guys, but fighting an old man. Yeah, that, but that that's curiosity. What, he is that fighting heavyweight in his upcoming fight. He's fighting um Kubra Pulev, so that's a legit fight. Sure, I know, but that's what I mean. I mean he, he fights all his mandatories. You know what I mean? But there would be some legitimate you know, curiosity in a in a Shannon Briggs. Oh fight. yeah, I think there would be curiosity, but you gotta. Uh, but I think his next fight against Pulev is probably the best heavyweight fight out there right now. Yep. I mean, just don't make it ugly, man. I'm I'm really tired of the the the, the holding and hugging and yeah, leaning, it, on, the, leaning you know on the back I mean? of the neck. Yeah, he. I think the he fight. Doing so with, much in the last fight, he 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 kind of took that guy out, but that guy was a bum. Right, right. Honestly, Leah Pai shouldn't have never been in that fight. If if Dennis Boyd so just actually came in shape and did his job. Okay, let's exactly. move on. Let's let's move on to uh, the news segment. But before we go to the news segment, um, I got a question for you, Natty. What did you um, if you checked out our show last? Did you check out our show last week? I don't think so. What was it about? Uh, we was talk. Well, this is to you, either you or or Sean. Uh, we were talking about, about, about the Deadspin article. We were talking about the Deadspin article about um, Floyd Mayweather, and I was wanting to know your assessment on uh, uh, the Deadspin article about Floyd Mayweather in terms of uh, they did a hard hitting piece on his history of, of domestic violence, and we had a discussion on that. Um, your thoughts on that? Either either guy, either you or um, Sean can chime in. I I don't know anything about Floyd Mayweather and his history of domestic violence. I've never I've read that article or anything of that nature. You know what I mean? To be completely honest with you, I don't really get into Floyd's personal life like that. But if he's a woman beater, I don't rock with that. You know what I'm saying? I've I've never condoned or you know advocated. <laughs> abuse of women. You know what I mean? I have a wife. I have two daughters. I'm not with that. So, But as far as Floyd goes, I don't know his personal business like that, man. I only deal with Floyd as a boxer. Um, you sure? I think a lot of the people in the comments, I, I didn't read it because I just got back from the Philippines. So I, I didn't listen to it, but I just read the comments that people were making and some of the backlash you guys were getting. You know, I don't think anything is what people say is any different. I mean, Floyd is one of the best fighters in the world, if not the best. He has skill. You know, he's repped the, the, the U.S. and the Olympics, and since then he's went on and he's proven himself as a boxer. As a person, you know, the Mayweathers have always been... 
<laughs> you know, a violent crew that have. There, there've been, always been a little bit off kilter. Let's well, just... all all three of them, I think, have been convicted of of felony abuse to women. So right, I mean, but they're, they're, but they've always but listen, they're not perfect. I don't think many fighters who are in the sport are perfect. They've had their own pitfalls and, and vices and downfalls. Yeah, but my, my thing is that, you know, people will defend Floyd and, and fucking all the flow moles will go crazy about that kind of thing. But the point is, he's a great fighter, but he's not a great person. And when you're the number one boxer in the world and the number one paid athlete, you're going to get lots of recognition. And, and if you're a bag, you're going to get negative recognition. And you're going to have people write articles about what a fucking idiot you are. I mean, you can't blame the media for jumping on the fact that you make it easy for them by doing things and getting convicted for it. I mean, as far as a boxer, no one can say that he's not great. He is. I don't like him, and everybody knows that. But I mean, I think a lot of that is also based on his style of avoiding people and the fact that he is a douche, and I just never really dug him. But I mean, no one's going to say he wasn't a great fighter. That he's not a great fighter. He is. I think. He, I think. I, mean, I think. There's two guys in the sport that have great skill, but they don't have their own pitfalls. And that's one is Floyd, and the other is Ray. Yeah. And but we don't have to get into that because we've, we've covered all that. Yeah. yeah. But oh, the, yeah. but Go the ahead. point is, that's that'll never be like the thing with Floyd is. I will never question his skill. He may be the most gifted fighter we've had in the last 25 years as far as natural ability sure. for skill, and I will never take that away from him. I, I do have an issue with the way he conducts his business and his and his personal behavior. That I have an issue with. But other than that, I, I think he's I think he's, he's, he's a great fighter. He's a great fighter. Athletes, I can't take it away from athletes him. Athletes are not perfect. I mean, Michael Vick, you know, the lots of them. There's like Historically, it's always been an issue. You can be a great athlete; doesn't mean you're a great oh, person. No, and I've and I've always and I my opinion when the article came out, I, I actually was on it was on Facebook on a on a boxing page, and I even said I said, listen, you should never idolize an athlete. They are the most imperfect human beings on the planet. Charles Barkley, I'm not <laughs> a role model. And you know what? You know what he does with the thing. Charles Barkley makes me laugh because he acts like this righteous person now, but he was one of the most imperfect human beings as a basketball player. But um, he will tell you that. Oh yeah, he won't lie about it. He won't lie about. It. He won't bullshit about that. He he'll tell you he wasn't perfect. Gambling, huh? yeah. Drinking, gambling. Yeah, you know, he, he'll tell you he ain't perfect. Right in his faults. That's why yeah, he said like, early on. Like, when just like pro. you know, just like Bernard Hopkins will tell you, I'm not perfect either. But in boxing, I'm perfect. I did all the right things in boxing. In personal life, I wasn't perfect. You know, yeah. but I, I appreciate athletes that do say that they're not perfect. But my thing is, I have no, I really have you know no issue with Floyd as far as him as a fighter because he's his, he's a great fighter. He's a great yeah. fighter. I'll never take that away from him. My issue with him is the way he conducts business and the way he, you know, conducts himself outside of the ring. That's my issue. Yeah, and I mean, being a top athlete, you're gonna get this kind of stuff. If you just look at ESPN the other day, you know, just to show the scrutiny athletes are under, the, the one of their number one articles was talking about this Kazakhstan volleyball player and is she too beautiful? It's like, like really, is that even fucking worth talking about? That this girl is beautiful and that's a drawback. I mean. You know, being a media member, you're looking for stories. You're going to focus on top athletes, and you're going to go for the angle that sells. So with no, Floyd, they're know. going for his negative. For her, they're going for her beauty. You know, it's it's like, always look at, like right, that. Look at, look, look at all the coverage Ray Rice is getting like recently with that whole situation, which is a which is a a, a whole big bat a big can of worms. You know, but, but you know, or the gay guy who just got drafted out of Missouri. You know, like, it all it, becomes it, bigger than sports. It becomes, the, the social issue becomes bigger than the sport when the sport really isn't that big to begin with. Yeah. In, yeah. in real life, when it comes to life, sports shouldn't be be that, that big. But the media makes it that big. 
It's called hyperbole, the, Ken. The new, yeah, yeah, absolutely, we live in. absolutely, but that's but that's the society we live in. We live in a depraved society where we idolize people that are imperfect, no matter what their what their downfalls are. And and I think and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna not not you know and and I don't expect athletes to be perfect. I already know they ain't perfect because and I never idolize them. I I, I you know there's certain things I idolize in athletes, but I don't idolize them completely. You There's can't. a long list of athletes that the media's built up, and then they've ripped down. What I don't Tiger like Woods, is Tiger called, Woods, Tiger Woods, Lance Armstrong. Tiger Woods, you know, Lance Armstrong. Uh, what's her face? The the the, the track star, Marion Jones. I mean, you know, this has always been the thing. Mike Tyson, you know, he was huge, and then they love you know, to build you up, and they love to tear you down, and exactly. that's how society is. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, that's why. You, you can't take it so serious. And I mean, with this article with Floyd, if I was Floyd, I wouldn't even acknowledge it. It is what it is. You just move on and don't even well, just look ignore at, it. Look at him. He's because, I mean, it, he's in the middle of one his aspect. Training camp. He's in the middle of his training camp right now. Why does he have to worry about some stupid article? He's got business to take care of. He has a fight coming up in September. He has no time for that. Exactly, which is far more important for his career. I mean, what's done is done. You need to move on past it. The same as Vic, you know, the whole dog fighting thing is done. So you move on, and you become the best pro you can, and hopefully you leave all the negative stuff behind you when you grow up, and, like yeah, Hopkins, right? You know, a guy that went to prison and now it's sort of forgotten. And the crazy thing with Vic is he's in a big market like New York, and not once has he been like torn down in a paper here about his. About his dad, you know, about his dog fighting because I think he paid his dues for that. I don't think there's any reason to keep what he did was horrible, absolutely horrible. Any, 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 but he, but guess what? He paid his dues. He paid for what he did. He, he apologized. Move on. And, and, you know, it, it, it sold. It was about money, and that's it. It's over with now. Okay, let's the move funny on. Thing is, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say the funny. Th Thing is, Michael Vick doing what he did to dogs will get far more criticism than Floyd Mayweather what he did towards women. <laughs> you know, the animals have a far stronger support network than women do in our society. That's how depraved we are. Just like I said. Yeah, let's move on. I just want to get that uh, an opinion on that because, like Ken said, we got a lot of. Uh, Responses towards that. Um, it, it, uh, news of the week. Since we're doing this on a Tuesday instead of a Thursday, uh, not a lot of news has dropped. But one thing that's been mentioned is a um, potential uh, fight between Carl Froch and uh, super middleweight champion and Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. It seems like there are early discussions going on for a potential bout between those two for January 24th um, as a target date. Um, and any of you guys can chime in. Um, your thoughts on the potential, uh, on a potential bout between uh, uh, Frosch and Groves? Do you think it will be held here uh, in the States, or is there a possibility that they could pull Frosch, um, pull Chavez Jr. over in England? Um, I'm thinking here it's going to be here. If the fight happens, it's going to be here probably in Vegas, but you yeah. never know. Well, I think it's pretty much a done deal because Frosch basically said that he was gung ho and keen to fight a big fight in Vegas. And, and that would be the fight, right? Because Chavez, he, he's much more marketable in Vegas than he is in the UK. I think it's a, it's a great fight. I mean, you know, they both bring toughness to the cards, and uh, you know they're going to fight. It's going to be a good watch, even if the skill level is not at the, the higher levels. But, you know, that's not bad. Sometimes uh, that makes for better TV. Uh, your thoughts, Ken? I think it's a great fight. I think I think the idea that it's rumored that it's going to be on pay per view, and I think it'll be a big sell. Oh God, yeah. I, I, I think that's the type of that's the type of pay per view that would be that would that would easily do two and a half. Yeah. Easily, easily two and a half million buys, and and I think it's a great paper, and I think it's a great pay per view, depending on how you build it. But the main event is stellar. Listen. Do you think it, do you think it will hurt anything that is not in a traditional pay per view month? Say a May or a September. No, no. People love to watch knockout, drag out, street fights. This is what Frock and Chavez bring to the table. You're gonna have Frock wanting to come for you. You're gonna have 
Okay. Chavez coming forward. The only thing that I think may play a factor in this fight is Chavez's size because he's a big, big guy. And for people, for and people say, oh, he's not his dad. Well, he's never going to be his dad. But you know what? He's a pretty damn good fighter for what it's worth. And he's going to get. And I think he's going to give. You know, Frock, holy hell, and I think it's going to be a great fight. I don't want to give an immediate prediction because I, I really want to look at this fight first before I really make a solid, solid prediction. But I think if anything, that the Chavez size-wise has the edge, but we've seen Frock knock out guys that are bigger than him. And Frock has shown boxing skills. I mean, so I think against a guy like him early on, he might just use a lot more movement and a lot more jab and then make uh, Chavez chase him a lot more. Right, right, but you know that, and, and but the thing with Ch Chavez is he never stops coming. You could beat him to a pulp, and we've seen Sergio Martinez do it, and shut ne nearly shut both of his eyes, and he never stopped coming. But the good thing Almost about Frost, he's also tough at the end of the fight, too, so I mean, he... Yeah, he I, 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 you gotta admit, this is round. very... This is no matter how. But but but, but here's the thing. Uh, when has Fr when has Froch been in against a guy that will consistently, uh, continually and continually uh, attack his body in the way that Chavez Jr. will, round but after Chavez round after he round. Hasn't done that so consistently against the last guy he fought two times. He didn't go to the body as much as he did previously. Not like he did against a guy like Andy Lee. So you know. With movement and stuff, you can you can take away his body attack, and we will we will see what he brings to it. I mean, that is a strong thing. You know, that that was one of the best things I liked about him because he went to the body so hard. But his last few fights, he he hasn't been so hard going towards it. I think so. he I think, and you make a good point. Um, you know, Sean's, and I think he needs to get back to that because that's what got him to the top was the body no matter who he was fighting he always exactly. consistently went to the body if it was a club fighter a journeyman or even a, a fringe contender he went to the body and I think in the last few fights against Vera and remember Brian Vera is not is a stationary target he's not a mover he'll fight with you yeah and 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 he didn't go to the body as much I think he needs to get back to that I think that would, would make the fight compelling if there, if if Frock can get to the body, I mean, if Chavez can get to the body and consistently get there, that would make it a really, really interesting fight down the stretch. But I think it's a great fight. I think it's a great fight, and and I hope it happens in January and be perfect. Begin the year with such a great fight. Pardon yes. me, fellas, I had an issue. <laughs> Uh, no problem. Uh, we was talking about uh, before we move on to the uh, boxing preview and uh, start to shut down the show. Y'all get your word on this, Natty. We're talking about um, a potential bout that's between Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. and Carl Frotch. Uh, rumored early negotiations going on for a journey of January 24th target date, uh, probably in Las Vegas. Your thoughts on this fight, Natty? Oh, I'm with it, man. That's an excellent fight, Carl Frotch. You see, Carl, uh, Carl Frost is at the point of his career that he, he he's just making money fights right now, man, What whatever sells. I mean, he's, what, 38 years old? What is he trying to do? You know, fight some young buck up and coming for, for, for petty cash? I don't think so. You know what I mean? He's trying to make the big dollars, and Julio Cesar Chavez brings the big dollars, especially in the United States. And, but you know what the crazy thing is? It took him to the age of 38 to finally get a fight in a in a prime That's the fight game. I want, Sean. The Gale. <laughs> but he's not. Yeah, but, but, but why would he fight the Gale, right? I mean. Listen, I'm going to tell you why he's not fighting. The, he wouldn't entertain a fight with the Gale. It's high risk, little reward. That's it. Yeah. That's the only reason. But, but that's the no fight point. I would want to see. And, and yeah, Gale should fight Grove. See if he can get fucking revenge. And then he would push himself up there for, for a big fight. We we will see we will see but Groves is wants some wants a I say a, a comeback fight to you know get his confidence back up there. Yeah, he already has a fight scheduled that, yeah. that he's gonna fight um for for um for some ranking or something and then he's yeah. so he's he's kind of going after the uh um that that Saki Obika Darrell that. Jay Leon love that circle right now. Yeah, man. I mean, the girl. I, I think the girl and um um Carl Frost will make a good fight in Wembley Stadium. 
I mean, I, I think they'll, they'll do the 80,000 80, or the or 70,000 or whatever. I think they'll do that. You know what I mean? Just just based on the, on both of their personalities. I'm well, seeing some side eye over there from you, Sean. What's going on? I see some side eye. No, I, I was just saying, you know, I, I think he needs a big fight before he would pull in those numbers in the UK. Uh, but what I was going to say, Darrell is coming back, right? He just yeah, uh, he broke off with fifty match. So, I mean, talk about the best fighter in the division who's been fucking gone since Abraham hit him late. I mean, God, it's good to see him come back. Hopefully he can get some fights. Maybe, yeah, uh, what happened was he was stuck with 50 for a while. Yeah, he was in that SMS situation. Yep, yeah, he was stuck with 50, and now he, he, he broke the contract with 50. And as soon as he broke the contract, he got a fight. <laughs> he, got, he, got, he signed with Heyman. But you know what? I will say this. I'm not a big fan of Heyman, but you know what? He gets his fighters' fights. As soon yeah. as you get with him, he got you a fight. Mm -hmm. It's not like any of this this crap where you sign with somebody and you can't get a fight. He'll get you a well, fight. I mean, his brother was getting championship fights, and he wasn't. I mean, you know, yeah, what's and going on what, there? Just, and you know what? And and his brother's got a, a, a fight coming up, too, his rematch with Beaker. So this is good, good, good but, but we see what it is now. He was waiting out the contract. We yeah, what it he is. was waiting it out because he wasn't getting any fights. Exactly. He was waiting out the contract. And as soon as the contract is over, see ya. And I'm back in the ring. I, I, it had to be something. You don't wait. You don't sit around and wait time under, like that. Did he have one fight under 50? He had one fight under 50, and it was a tune-up against a, a journeyman, and he was supposed to get a bigger fight after that, and it just never materialized. Never happened. Like, he looked around and said, this dude doesn't know what he's doing. I, I mean... I don't blame him for leaving 50 Cent because 50 Cent, he's become, he's developing a reputation as a man that simply doesn't know how to move fighters. Look what he did to Mark Davis. He moved him into a fight with a guy with, with Michael Ferenis, and Michael Ferenis gave Gamboa his fight a holy hell and got his fight, and he put him in with Ferenis, and Ferenis knocked him out. He doesn't know how to move fighters. Billy Dibb, look what he did with Billy Dibb. Uh, <laughs> oh god! Listen, he ruined with, with Gamboa. Yeah, Gamboa is Gamboa is fighting that too high of a weight class. But, but for Gamboa, at least that works out because now he's a commodity again. He could get a yeah. big fight. He looked good. He looked he looked good early in that fight, but you know he shouldn't the have been fighting. Got Terrence knocked Crawford out at 135. It's just no, what, no, he shouldn't have been fighting against, against him from the beginning. No, he shouldn't have been fighting at 35, but the fact he showed heart and toughness yeah. and the way he kept coming back when he was getting hurt and knocked down. He's celebrable. And he was he managed to hurt Terrence Crawford in the final round before he was knocked out ultimately. Yeah. So, so so his stock went up, but he has to move down and wait. Exactly. But he yeah. has to move down and wait. But the but the whole thing with with 50 is at the end of the day, he don't know how to move fighters. He don't understand. He's too young in the game to be having these experienced fighters and trying to move them into these. Yeah, he's, just out. he's had several opportunities to promote what he's doing as far as the fight game, and he just doesn't even talk about it. Any interview you see him with, check it. Look on it. On, look on the net. Any interview you see him with on on the Hot 97, the Breakfast Club. Whatever interviews he's doing, he see how do many times he brings up that. boxing or any of his fighters. But the no, problem with 50 is he never took the time out to really learn the um, intricacies of the game, the intricacies, the subtle nuances of the promoting you know business. He you thought know what? he could just jump in and based on his name alone, he could get fighters and he could get fights. And it doesn't work that way. These fighters did. They saw 50 Cent. They saw his name. They jumped and they signed with him. And as soon as they got with him... They, as soon as they're after their first fight and the way he was moving, they were probably sitting there saying, we shouldn't sign with this man. This man is moving careers wrong. how he did business in other arenas, and he was successful at business in other arenas outside of rap. But what 50 Cent does, did was burn his bridges in the in the boxing game. Well, you know guess what? I mean? what? Well, guess what? a lot of people off in the boxing game, and then he thought he could jump out the window and do it on his own, but they're powerful people that you pissed off, man, and they're going to blackball you. And guess what? And guess what? Guys like like Aram, and guys like those guys, those are sharks. Remember, yep. even though Aram's in his 80s, that man's still a shark. And if you yep. see the guy oh, that's... You want to take my fighter? I got something for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, they, 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 listen, they, he's had, he hasn't been in boxing long enough to understand the intricacies of the yeah, game. Yeah, man, boxing this is not hip-hop, this is not headphones, <laughs> this is not vitamin water. <laughs> no, this is... This is, this this is a game is, that was run by the mob, fam. Yep, run by the mafia, run by underworld yeah. figures that you couldn't, eat, and they were better than you would ever, ever be. This is a sport that was controlled for about 30 years by Frankie Carbo. You you don't know nothing about the sport. Yeah, man. <laughs> Let, let's <Yeah>. be real. <laughs> now on boxing news, what about the news about Aram and his orgy with Ali? <laughs> you know what? You know what? Really? You know what? You know what? I, 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 I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. You didn't need to. You didn't need to ruin my show by mentioning that, sir. Really? <laughs> Come on, man. You go talk about that on my show, man. I'm trying to have to show with some decent amount of class and decorum and respect. You say it's boxing, good or bad. But that's not Aww. bad. That's just outright ratchet, sir. <laughs> really? You gonna troll my show with that kind of story? Really? I told you. I told you. Nah, he just tried to. He just was trying to make it funny after we rip it on Fifty Cent for about oh, ten minutes. Oh man! Oh man! This guy here. I'm not even gonna mention that. Moving on. Out of control. Uh, let's, let's preview what ha what's going to happen. What's going down this weekend? Uh, double header on HBO. Interesting double header. Um, first, first part of the double header is going to be happening in Atlantic City, I believe, and the second half is going to be happening in Vegas. First part one is Sergey Kovalev. He's making his return to the ring in Atlanta City, defeating his WBO light heavyweight belt against uh, Blake Caparillo. Caparello, excuse me for mispronouncing his name or pronouncing yeah. his name wrong. Um, second part is Brandon Rios, um, first fight in the ring since his loss to Manny Pacquiao, fighting Diego Chavez in a Wilson Wade contest. Uh, let's talk about Kovalev and Caparello. Um, Going into this fight, the, the big rumor, of course, is a potential Kovalev battle with Hopkins uh, in November. Um, I guess the guy in Caparello, I hadn't seen much of him, so I'm leaning on you guys for um, some analysis of him. I only see like one fight I think on YouTube. Uh, your your thoughts on this fight and, and the chances of uh, uh, Caparello pulling off the upset here? No, no, and I'm going <laughs> to right, right off the bat. Um, Number one, Caparello, for what it's worth, and I'm going to say it right now, he's a good boxer. He's got good movement. He's slick. But good boxers is not going to cut it against Kovalev. It's not going to cut it. You're going to have to be an excellent boxer, a very a very elusive target for 12 rounds. And the thing with Caparello is I seen him in his fight against uh, Elvira Mariki that was on ESPN. And for a guy who... Proclaimed himself as like a, a boxer slick. He gets hit a little bit too much for my taste, and I think I think early on Caparello will be able to negotiate his way through a couple of those early rounds. But I think eventually Kovalev's power is going to show up if, between maybe I'd say by by at least the middle of the fight, and I think he gets him out of there. Mid mid rounds at the latest, the middle middle rounds could be earlier than that. But I think, it, based on Caparello's movement and his and, and you know his boxing, I think he's gonna sort of give Kovalev a little bit of trouble until Kovalev figures it out. Um, right. Quick any word from you guys on this fight? Any the lack, the lack was a good boxer as well, and see what happened to him. You know right, I mean? exactly. You can, listen, <laughs> listen. Agnew was a good is a, is a, is a, is a good boxer. And, yeah. and Agnew gave him trouble, so I think they're trying to uh, clean that up. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think that's why they got back in with another boxer because they want another to boxer back. and a boxer with an undefeated record. <laughs> yep, eight. Yep. But Agnew was real defensive. I mean, he didn't open up much. That's why it was a tough fight. Whereas this guy, I mean, he's probably not going to be as defensive as Agnew was. Probably not, but Agnew did caught caught him with a nice body shot. I think they called it low, hmm. but that was a decent body shot. But I think it's good. You get him in with some slick fighters before he fights Hopkins. You know, I mean, putting in rounds against I mean, that, guys that actually have anything skill. helps. But Hopkins is a different animal. <laughs> Any anything uh, helps. Yeah, but, but I don't think at 50 he's got the legs those young guys have. I yeah, 
But I, I don't think Hopkins has to use his leg so so much. It has to. It, he just uses subtle movement nowadays. But the problem with Hopkins, you know, and this goes back for a long, for quite a while. His problem is he's good with dudes that that he can control the pace. Yeah, okay. But with guys that like are volume punchers, he, just, he doesn't throw enough to win, and that's where he loses. And I mean, against a guy like Kovalev, who is going to throw volume? That's where he's just not going to be able to beat him. Even with his skill and slickness, it's going to be hard for him to like to to stop Kovalev from being aggressive and throwing combinations and throwing. John, you're punches. going to be very surprised at the, the the how how Kovalev's volume is going to decrease against Hopkins. Sure, that happens. But I mean, people say the same thing when Floyd fought fought uh, Maidana, who we know Maidana is not top five at 147. But he was still able to use lots of volume against a, a slick, slick, slick guy that decreases everybody's volume. But he couldn't really decrease Maidana's volume that much because he just he was in he there. He just decreased his clean punching. <laughs> he just yeah. couldn't land. Yeah. He threw he a lot of shots, but he just couldn't punch, land but, cleanly. But because he threw volume, it looked like a closer fight, and lots of people yeah. had it closer. And then that's where the benefit happens, right? And that, that's going to be the thing that... I think is going to be tough for Hopkins. Like when he lost to Chad Dawson, it was because, you know, volume. And the fact that, um, well, we will talk about that later. I just think Hop uh, Chad Dawson presents some other factors as well because I think yeah. as good as Hopkins is, he still struggles somewhat to get somewhat against uh, South Paws. Yeah, he but always has to his career. But it, 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 Dawson is a rangy guy. He's yeah, the, the, the height, the range, and the skill of Dawson. Yeah, that's what it was. Just no matter no matter what, how many times they fight, um, uh, he would that just style would give Hopkins trouble. He's not gonna, he's not going to face that against the, the likes of a Kovalev. That's why he never really wanted to fight Chad Dawson. Chad Dawson is not a guy that Hopkins called out ever. He never wanted to get in the ring with Chad Dawson to begin with. Because but you gotta he wants understand. Kovalev. <laughs> he definitely wants Kovalev. Because you know why he wants Kovalev? Because he sees a guy that, you know, he kind of – Kovalev is the type of guy he's been sort of fighting lately, these, yes. these aggressive guys. Like, he's you know, very calculated you know, with his cloud. It just falls into that same pattern that he's been fighting lately. I'm not, not saying that, that Kovalev ain't going to win. And I'm not saying Hopkins is 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 gonna win. I'm just saying it falls in that line of the same type of fighters. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on and talk about the second half of this HBO doubleheader. Um, as Brandon Rio, Rios making his return to the ring, fighting uh, Diego Chavez. Right. Uh, Chavez gave Keith Thurman a decent scrap last year. Uh, he was stopped in ten, I believe. Uh, I look at this fight. Listen, for me, yeah, it's gonna be exciting just because of Rios and the way he fights. He's going to get hit uh, by Chavez, but uh, it, but also Chavez is hittable. Uh, my question is, I wonder if Brandon Rios is still a legit welterweight um, in this fight, but I give him the edge just because of work rate and whatnot, but call me crazy, but I think Chavez may give him a decent scrap here. I'm going to jump in right now and say that... Not a decent scrap, a good scrap. I don't be surprised. Do not be surprised if Rios ends up having more trouble than he bargained for against Chavez. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking oh, the same. <laughs> you are so right. I, I'm thinking the same thing. I think I that don't he's going to be give surprised him a good if he even has more trouble or he ends up losing the fight. Let me tell. Let me tell you something, man. Brandon Rios. First of all. Brandon Rios is not a welterweight. No, he's not. He's let's, start, let's start right there. Let, let, let's get – I'm going to tell you what he is. Right now. He is I'm, not a welterweight. I'm he's not a junior welterweight. Diego Chavez is not a world beater by any stretch of the imagination, but he is the legitimate welterweight, and he does have welterweight power. Okay? Rios is still a junior welterweight in my opinion. Junior, I, I will, I will say this. He's 135 still. Maybe. I wouldn't go that far, but I think he's a. I don't know why I go that far because the, the, the why he was why he was draining himself at at lightweight is because he was waiting to the last minute to lose the weight. You know what I mean? He was there, there's a difference between training to lose the weight and sitting in the sauna to lose the weight. And he was on the sitting in the sauna side of things. 
If he was actually putting in that work, I think he could actually make the 135. But let's say he's a 140 pounder. Even at 140 pounds, he didn't pack that much of a punch. Yes, he he knocked out Mike Alvarado, but that was a TKO. He didn't knock him unconscious, and that was accumulation of punishment right. that got Alvarado out of there. You know what I mean? And then guess, but then guess what? A guy, an Al Alvarado in the mm -hmm. rematch, a guy with C-level boxing ability was yeah. able to outbox him. Outbox him, right? Diego Chavez, to me, I believe is going to knock him out because Brandon Rios only has one way to fight. And he's going to fight in the pocket. He's going to fight the way he fought at lightweight. He's going to fight the way he fought at junior welterweight. In the pocket, head first, throwing shots. And Chavez is not the slickest guy out there, but he could box a little bit, right? And he punches harder. And if he goes, trades blow for blow with Brandon Rios, I think Chavez wins that, that particular competition of who hits harder in the pocket. I'm going to say this right now. I, I understand why people would pick Rios. Um, he's the more established guy. He's been, you know, he's he's got a little bit more, you know, like the name value and he's been in there. He's won a championship and all that, but not at 47. <laughs> Listen, and I'm going to under I'm going to make people understand that he's actually fighting a welterweight in this fight. He's not fighting a guy who's coming up in weight. He's not like he's not. He's fighting an actual welterweight. Like yeah, people will say, "Well, what about Pacquiao?" Um, news note, guys. Pacquiao Pacquiao's is not Pacquiao a welterweight. Fighter. Yeah, he's just a guy who fights at one forty seven. Exactly. Listen, Pacquiao's not a welterweight, but despite that, he's a special fighter. Right. And he, and he can make anybody look bad, and he can absolutely school him like he did to Rios. But I just don't think. I just don't see the thing with, with me with Rios is he loses fights, but there's going to be one fight where he comes in and he's going to lose to somebody that he doesn't that he's not supposed to lose to. And I think this could be the guy. This could be. I'm not saying it will be, but it could be the guy. But I think this is going to be a very tough fight. And um, also, don't, don't you think? Don't you think, given Rios' style, the fact that he takes so much punishment, there's going to be a moment. Look. I agree with Hopkins when he says that fighters don't lose guys. Guys don't lose, don't lose it in the ring. They lose it in training. But to me, it's just going to be a one situation, one fight where Rios is going to show up, and it's going to be obvious he's not going to have anything. And, listen, and I think it's going to be sooner than later. And I'm going to be honest with you. I saw some videos of Rios several months ago, and he was walking around, like in in in. You know Robert Garcia's gym, and this man looked like he was 190 pounds. He did not. He, did not. he looked like he was about 180, 190 pounds. And at some point, that's going to catch up with him. He cannot keep crashing like that. That is called crash losing weight. That's stuff that you know. I that stuff that 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 Roberto Duran used to do. Crash losing weight. This go down so quickly and eventually that catches up to you and I think it's going to catch up to Rios in one of these fights and it's going to catch up to him against a guy that is unheralded that nobody knows like Chavez and I think I think he's, he's in for a tough fight I'm not going to say he wins but I think he's in for a tough night I, I, I I'll think the say way he fights yep. especially the way he fights he takes too many shots yeah and against a guy like Chavez who, who can punch and and I mean, let's just be real. He was able to hurt Thurman at times in that fight. So I you mean, know, he was, he was kind of outboxing them early. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? yeah, yeah. He but kind of you Thurman, know what Thurman had to adjust. He he Thurman had to adjust at some point in that fight. Yeah, that's true that a lot of people hurt Thurman, but if he was able to hurt Thurman, he must have some some power in those fists of his. He was, he hurt Thurman and he was winning the boxing match early on. Yes, he was outboxing Thurman early, and it was and the fight was still on the table before the knockout. Exactly. It seems like you're having issues with uh with our uh, thoughts that um, Chavez has a real chance to beat Re Brendan Rios. I'm Sean. No, no, I don't. Don't mind that. I just question the level of competition he's fought. I mean, before he fought Thurman, he 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 was unknown commodity. And then, because he had a good record and a good knockout record, he was fed to Thurman because it makes him look good. 
and he gave Thurman lots of problems. And then my point is, I, I, I don't say that he couldn't win. You know, it's a tough fight, 50-50. So it'll be interesting to see who wins. But I think people are too quick to uh, throw Rios under the bus and too quick to crown new people champions like Thurman. And, uh, you know, this guy is getting pushed because he gave Thurman a tough fight. But who's Thurman? Thurman hasn't beat any top ten guys yet. So, you know, I, I think it's still still early. And Rios well, look bad. For what it's worth, for what it's out, worth going Eddie? into the Thurman Chavez fight, I pick, actually, I pick Chavez to potentially pull off an upset. Me too. Um, the reason I'm picking uh, Chavez is more because of Rios than because of Chavez. The yeah. more how, because of how Rios fights and what he brings to the table more than what Chavez brings to the table. Chavez is just there. You know what I'm saying? He's the legit welterweight with pop, with decent boxing ability, and Rios has no plan B in his mm -hmm. fight game. Mm -mm. And he's un and plus he's undisciplined outside of the ring. And and we also got to take into effect he had a tough 12 rounds against Pacquiao in a fight where he was not in, in the fight, fight for one minute. For one minute, he was not in that fight. Sure, but I don't think that that means anything as far as what leads up to his next fight. No, because no, it probably doesn't because Pacquiao makes anybody who's a, a, a class below him look bad. So. And for me, I think Rios, it was obvious he was fight. He went, he went for that fight just for the money. Yeah, yeah I mean, his feet are too slow and his hands are too slow. Where where was the six pack that Ariza promised? <laughs> there was no there was a keg. There was no <laughs> six pack. Unlike Marquez, he wasn't on the PED, so he, he wasn't able to like oh, 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 body oh. and show the six pack. Hey Garcia got it. Mikey Garcia got it. Slander. No no Garcia for sure. It never looks Garcia never looks real. Mike Garcia but. got him a six pack. where where, where was Rios' six pack? <laughs> Darcy had a six pack, really. Yeah, in the last couple of fights. You sure they weren't four packs? <laughs> to the bottom. Wasn't the beer belly that Rios came into the ring with? Beer belly. I don't yeah, think but he Rios, had a beer belly. man. But let's be realistic. Rios, even his days at 135, he always yeah. came in not in the best. He didn't look. In top condition, and it, yeah, it, part of it's just because of how he's physically made. He doesn't genetic, have to cut those yeah. kind of genes. Yeah. But you know, another part of it. Let's face it, he's he's pretty undisciplined outside the ring. So it's just yeah, a and it's also I've also yeah, mentioned ninety percent of it. After the, even in you know, in the lead up to like the Pacquiao fight, I noticed like when you watched his thing that he did with the lead up to the Pacquiao fight, like you could see in his personal life. Something like mentally like, was like changing with it, changing with him. Like he became more like Rios at one time used to be balls to the wall, but like he seems to have gotten a little older now, and he's got a family now. He seems a little different now. Like he, he he's a little the ment the mentality of that that real fighter mentality. I don't know if, if it's still there or not. And that's one of the things that you know when you have a a guy you know, boxers that become family men and that's a lot of a lot of people say that's the worst thing sometimes for fighters because they lose their edge. Their life well, there's a more of a purpose with them in life like in life outside the ring. I mean I applaud when a fighter becomes like that because they realize, you know, they don't have to go through all that. But at the same time, I do agree that some fighters when they become like that they lose their edge a little bit. Well he matured, right? Yeah, I think he I think he did definitely mature. He he's still a wild guy, you know. But I think when it comes to family, he's a lot different now. Cause you can see once he's got the baby in his life, now he's a little different. He he doesn't seem to be uh, the same fighter. Like he doesn't have that edge. And 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 and, and it kind of played itself out, kind of in the pack. Pacquiao fight. Yeah, remember like before he he came to the before the family man. He was just. He was just from Oxnard, you know, from the streets of Oxnard. But now he's he's got a family now, and he's and he seems more mature, and he seems more like I don't know, maybe maybe he's ready for it. Maybe part of him is ready for it to be over. And there's nothing wrong with that. I I've always say with fighters, if they want to do that, great, you know, wonderful, because this is a brutal sport. 
Um, but I, I think there's something, like I even mentioned it to Mike, and he kind of agreed with me that there's something lacking there now. Like before that, before, like it seemed to happen right after the two Alvarado fights. That's where I think it happened. Yeah, absolutely. And I think on that note, we're going to um, start to shut the show. We're going to shut the show down. And um, uh, for, and I'll go to each of you, each of you guys on this one. Um, for those who want to find out information uh, about you guys, I'll start you on this one, um, Maddie. Uh, where, where can the folks go on the internet? It's all on social media if they want to find you and talk boxing with you. Yeah, man. Um, it's Mr. T Not to Turn a One, N A T T Y T U R N A, on YouTube, on um, Black Bird Sugar Boxing, uh, Facebook, Not to Turner, uh, Twitter, Not at Not to Turner. I'm out. I'm out there, man. Google me. <laughs> and for Sean, if they want to kick it and talk boxing with you, talk to Sweet Science, let the folks who know where they can find you. Yeah. Also, uh, YouTube and Google Sean Newton. Uh, I'm there. I'm uh, writing on everybody's pages, so it's easy to see me. <laughs> uh, can't let the folks see a what they can find. I'm going to just help Sean out. If there's a boxing video, he'll be there. I'm like Superman. <laughs> <laughs> let the folks know where they can find you, Jim, to talk to science. Me? You can reach me at facebook.com slash kent.airs.1. You get me up there for boxing. Um, I have a YouTube account that I really don't like. I have my my you know my subscriptions and whatnot, but I don't really go on you know act. I'm not an active person on there. But if you want to reach me there, you can reach me there at YouTube. Uh, um, I'm under Kent Ayers there, so you can reach me there or on um, the Facebook account. Yeah, and absolutely. If you want to find out information on me, y'all know where it is. Uh, you can check out the Pound for Pound Box Report to different two main links: uh, the blog page b4pboxreport.wordpress.com, the podcast page b4pboxreport.podomatic.com. On the blog page, you can find blogs written by yours truly, as well as links to the Pound for Pound Box Report uh, YouTube show and a podcast. Um, on the podcast page, uh, you can find all previous episodes of the Pound for Pound Box Report on the blog and the podcast page. You can find links of where to find us all over the internet: YouTube, Facebook, Google Plus. Uh, Twitter, Tumblr, uh, the Pinterest page, the RSS feed, the link to donate your account, and we're now on Stitcher Radio. Again, go to Stitcher Radio, check us out, download the show. If you're if you're driving on the road, check us out on Stitcher. If you're at the job in the cubicle, uh, go to Stitcher Radio and look up Pound for Pound Boxing Report, P O U N D, the number four P O U N D Boxing Report. And check us out and, and give us a review. We'd like to know what you hear, what you uh, your thoughts on the show and how if can you love or the hate show. the show. Please review. Absolutely. I'm, I'm at the point where people need to know if you love the show or you hate the show. Please review. Okay. Yeah. If if people on 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 YouTube want to love us or hate us, you can love or hate us. Okay. We don't, <laughs> we don't take comments that may be a little bit misinformed, critical. We're not those type of people. We're very nice people. We don't we but we but we we don't really like the negative comments that much. We'll be honest, but you can you can give us a comment, positive or negative. We we, we do read that stuff. We I don't keep, mind the negative comments. I just don't I just don't like the ignorant comments. That's yeah, why well that you gotta understand that some people don't they just don't have the the, the mental capacity to get a to give a, a, a well thought out intelligent comment they have to you know troll but that's okay because we we, we value them comments too sometimes <laughs> now, we never value those comments but but no 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 in all honesty we, we you know we like, comments. we like hearing you know you know if you like us or hate us it, it keeps us motivated to do what we do yeah, absolutely. On the next episode of the Pound for Pound Box Report, we will do a recap of Brandon Rios, Diego Chavez, and Sergio Corona, Blake Caparello. We will also do a preview of uh, the triple header on Showtime, um, Danny Garcia fighting uh, Rod Salka, uh, Lamont Peterson versus Edgar Santana, and Daniel Jacob versus uh, Jared Fletcher. Uh, why do we even have to review that card? <laughs> you have to just because it's a Showtime fight and it features guys. Look, I know the card is garbage. I know the card is garbage. But no, you know. I know, I know, I know. Is Jacob, is Jacob know. fighting for some regular title or some some crap listen, on that? Listen, Danny Garcia is not defending his belt. Thank God. 
Oh my god. Well, th that that's kind of throwback. Yeah, because the the guy, you know why he ain't defending the title? Back. You know why he ain't defending the title? Because the WBA and the WBC said we will not rank Rod Salka in the ratings. He's not even top fifty, and that was the end of that. <laughs> you so absolutely will talk about that farce, that farcical card, just because it's Showtime card featured Danny Garcia and uh, Lamont Peterson and whatnot. Game on Al <laughs> Heyman for putting on that mess. So we will talk about that and. We will probably end up trolling that card, but again, uh, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, like I said, when, when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When boxing is bad, we'll talk about it. Jones so Dog doesn't even like the card. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> For those who, are, who, who will be checking this out via podcast, basically, Sean Dog just basically turned his backside to that fight, so it tells you right now what, 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 what that card is really about. Um, I want to thank my um, guest, um, the Black Bird Sugar, Mr. N Natty Turner. I want to thank uh, joining us all the way live from Taiwan, Sean, my co-host again, Kent. Uh, for my co-host, Kent, Mr. Natty Turner, Sean Newton, I am your host, Michael. We will see you next time. You guys have a good evening. Good night. Peace.